to you. We're going to be looking at Psalm 23. It is the model for us for how God wants to be good. Last week, we looked at verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I will lack nothing. We know that the Lord wants to meet our needs. He wants to feed us. He wants to lead us. He desires to be that good to you. Today's verse is one that I believe all of us need to hear. This has been one of those weeks that I've, as I've been studying, I've had to stop and go, wow, I feel convicted. Wow, I feel challenged on this. Wow, I didn't realize how bad I am at this part of Christian living. And that's the whole concept of rest. Uh, And so this is something that I think we all need to look at. Um, This is about rest. God wants to give you rest this morning. God wants to be that good to you. He wants you to relax in his goodness. And if I'm honest, I don't think I'm really good at relaxing. I don't think I'm really good at resting in the promises of God, resting in God's grace. Um, A lot of us, I don't think, know how to do that. Um, I I think this is something that we could apply to everything in our lives. Uh, In America, we need to slow down, basically. There are studies that have shown that the typical average American is overworked, overstressed, sleep-deprived, and just overall way too busy. This is an interesting passage. I think you guys are all going to relate to this well. We don't know how to relax. We don't know how to rest. I want to do a little quiz for you this morning to see if this whole concept applies to you, okay? I want you to be truthful. Um, Please, no cheating in this, all right? I want you to raise your hand if these apply to you, okay? I want you to raise your hand if you feel like you are always in a hurry. Always in a hurry. Okay, Mike is like scurrying by. Yes, 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 yes. (laughs) Raise your hand if your to-do list always seems unrealistically long. You'll never finish it in one day. By the way, you know what, I'm just looking at, I'm just literally going through my schedule, so this is where I get the quiz for you. Do you use your day off to catch up on unfinished work? <laughs> Good job, Chase. Any parent, and parents feel like that? Your day off? Do you feel guilty when you relax? Like you feel like there's a sense of guilt. Like have you ever wanted to just take a day off but you felt like you got to make up this big long excuse about why this is going to happen and maybe even fib to your boss a little bit and say, oh man, I'm sick. You just want a day off. Raise your hand if you can't remember the last time that you took a whole day off resting. That's me. A whole day. Okay. If you can relate like I do, I think you're going to want to listen today. Dwelling in the goodness of God will give you rest. All right? Let's read verse 2 in Psalms 23. I want you to read it together with me, but I also want you to declare this because this is God's word for you. I want you to declare this as a promise that our good God makes to you. Would you read this with me? It's going to be up on the screen, Psalms 23, verse 1 and 2. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I will lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. When you think about that description, what, what does that imagery do for you? What does that bring to your mind when you think of quiet waters? Uh, you think of in the green pastures. What, do you, what, do you, what's, what words come to your mind? Peace. What would what you say? Top water. Fishing. Yeah, okay, okay. Some, some trout fishing maybe? Quietness, tranquility, refreshment, peace, um, the provision, it goes on and on. It says, he makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside quiet waters. That's rest. That's refreshment. That's here for you. And as we unpack that verse very quickly, I want you to first notice something, okay? Green pastures don't just happen. They're caused, all right? If you consider the landscape of the rolling hills of Israel as this psalmist was writing this, most of that land is barren. Most of that land is brown. Most of that land is rocky. For the sheep to lie down in green pasture would mean that there would have to be an intentionality for the shepherd to lead these sheep to the place that provides that. Green pastures are not 
they don't just happen, they're caused. Much like living in a stressful world today, most of us live in places that it's just spiritually barren. Maybe at the workplace, maybe in life, whatever it might be. Maybe we're up against rocks in our life. We need to trust the good shepherd for rest and refreshment. I also want you to see that in that passage it says, he makes me lie down. I want you to circle that in your Bible or in your notes. He makes me. Just like green pastures don't just happen, they're caused, rest doesn't just happen. It's intentional. It's caused. Okay? I want you to get this. God has designed us with parameters where we require rest. When he says, he made me to lie down, it means that he has made you, he has set a pace for you where you have got to learn how to rest. You know, we are not designed to live like many Americans, the way many Americans are living today. We are overworked. We are overstressed. That's why there's so much stress and mental fatigue in this world. We're not going at the pace that Christ has set for us. We're not striving for a sense of rest and refreshment. And we don't stay in that pace. We find ourselves drawing away from God's plan. God has made it so clear to us we need rest. Sometimes it's the good shepherd. He has to make us rest. Has anybody ever been in a position where you were forced to lie down? where you're forced to be at the point where you just couldn't do anything else, an illness, a hurt foot like my foot is is today, and that's why I'm sitting. They're making you lie down. Sometimes God has to do that. But I want to give you three reasons why we need to find our rest in God this morning. And I want you to write these down in your study notes, okay? The first one is, my best requires rest. My best requires rest. To give God the very best of me, it requires rest. And I'm sure you can relate to me. Isn't it amazing how perspectives change after a good night's sleep? You know, my children, we have a designated sleep time in our household. And it's the same routine every night. The time comes, and it's time to go to bed. We have them clean up their toys, get ready for bed. They put on their PJs. They brush their teeth. We maybe read them uh, something. We tuck them into bed, and that's the routine every night. We want them to get sleep. And within that routine, my wife and I have come to accept this secondary routine, and that is their routine of constantly defying bedtime. (laughs) These kids of ours have learned the master, they've learned to master stalling when it comes to bedtime. And maybe you can relate to me on this, but as soon as we put them to bed, we tuck them in, we think the world is good. We have come to now realize that one or two or all four of our children are going to come down the stairs with some sort of problem, some sort of dilemma, some sort of need, and it's all about stalling. Some kid needs a drink of water. The other kid has to ask a question about the meaning of life that they just now thought of that they have to discuss. Some of them had a bad dream before they fell asleep. Whatever it is... It's a constant stream, and the whole point is we need to resist a rest. They don't want to miss. They don't want to do that. It's because by nature, we don't want to rest. It is caused. It doesn't just happen. The point is they want to resist going to sleep because they don't want to miss anything. And the problem is that they don't understand is that they will resist until they're utterly exhausted. Do you parents know anything like that? Well, your kids are finally at the, at the breaking point and they fall asleep on the floor because they can't handle it anymore. The problem is, is when they're not rested, they miss so much more the next day because they can't focus, can they? Because they have trouble functioning because they get grumpy. They're short fused with the people they love. And what we've come to realize is that children in general resist arrest because they're immature. Resisting rest is immaturity. Now, I'm going to bring it to us. Because I think we have become quite good at resisting rest, haven't we? I think we've become the masters of stalling. You know that there is a billion-dollar industry out there that sells products to you to keep you from falling asleep. Think about some of that stuff. 
Go to the gas station. We've got all kinds of stuff. We've got five-hour energy drinks, don't we? We've got the super drinks that have like massive amounts of caffeine and, and sugar, uh, you know, monsters and things like that. We've got prescriptions. We've got coffee. That's my love. And again, as I'm saying this, I'm going, oh, geez, I've got to really work on this stuff. There's a billion-dollar industry. We have learned to master the art of resisting rest. We're so afraid that we're going to miss something. We're so afraid that we're, go- we're not going to be successful. Has anyone ever said, boy, there's just not enough hours in the day? Sometimes we need a parent to tell us to go to bed. Sometimes we need a good shepherd. Sometimes we need someone to say, you need to lie down in green pastures. Your best requires rest. Rest in me. Be still and know that I am God because this is for your best and your best requires rest. Does that make sense? I'm building a case for you. Psalms 127 verse 2 says this, It is senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, fearing that you will starve to death. For God wants his loved ones to get their proper sleep. Your best requires rest. Number two, rest is often the difference between being blessed or being stressed. It is the focal point between being blessed or being stressed. There is this account in Scripture that I love, and most of you are familiar with it. It's with Mary and Martha, these two sisters that are living in the same house together, and they get a visitor. Jesus Christ himself comes to their house to have dinner, to just fellowship with him. And this account tells the story of the two personalities, one where Martha sees this group of people coming, and she frantically begins to prepare meals and get her house ready for her guests. And I can just imagine what she's doing in the kitchen as she's talking and and preparing the food, and she's rushing around and making sure the dishes are together, and she's stressed out to the max because she has visitors. Can you just imagine her saying, oh, great, Jesus is here, wonderful. I thought my day was already busy, and now I've got all this. Oh! Oh, he brought 12 friends. Isn't that great? Wouldn't you just like that, to have that sort of visitation happen to your house? So this is happening, and as she looks out through the kitchen, she sees in the living room there's Mary. And Mary is doing the exact opposite of Jesus. He, she is resting at the feet of Jesus, just soaking in this experience. And I can imagine what Mary was thinking. Mary is thinking, I just can't believe this. The Son of God, Almighty Creator of the stars in my living room. The Lord of hosts. I'm hosting the Lord of hosts. And she's quietly sitting at the feet of Jesus. And what's crazy about this is it's two women in the same house that have a completely different experience when they encounter Christ. And Martha comes into the living room, and again, I'm paraphrasing, this is Schmidt's version, but can you imagine saying, um, she goes to Jesus and says, listen, you know, I I got all this work to do, and don't you think it's a little unfair that my sister is here when she should be helping me work all all these things out? And Jesus just said, you know, Mary picked the right thing. I want you to rest. I want you to enjoy my presence. And the difference between being stressed and being blessed is rest. Do you see that in that scenario? How often do we apply stress to the the workings of Christ as if it's a stressful thing? When Christ comes into our life, when we're engaged in encounter with Christ, how many of you were stressed coming to church this morning? Making sure you got here on time, making sure your clothes matched, making sure everything was ironed and pressed and fighting with your kids to get in the car. Sometimes we see it as a stressful thing when it is a blessing. And sometimes the difference between the perspective is just how rested we are in Christ. It is often the difference between rest, uh, blessed and stressed. Relaxing in the presence of God allows us to see blessings in what otherwise might be labeled as stress. You're a better person. You're a better boss. You're a better parent. You're a better spouse. You're a better friend. You're a better neighbor. You're a better disciple when you rest. If you're not rested, you're like the person described in Job chapter 20. It says this, verse 18, there's about 10 verses to describe the overworked person. But in verse 18, I like the message paraphrase version of this. It says, they are unable to relax and enjoy anything they've worked for. 
The third reason to rest is really the one that I believe matters the most, and that's because God said so. God says it's important. You are to rest because God said it's important. God has set up a rule in your life that you are to rest. He called this the Sabbath. Has everybody ever heard that word before? You understand it? The word means a day of rest. That's it. It's a holy day that God has established with you. He is set apart. It's right in the Ten Commandments. It's number four of the Ten Commandments. We are to rest. Exodus chapter 20 says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. I want you to notice that too because God expects us to work. He doesn't expect us to be sluggers. He doesn't expect us to just live off of other people. He wants us to work. And it says, Six days, do your labor, do your work. Don't be a sluggard. But on the seventh day, it's the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work. And then God spends the most time out of all the commandments. He goes another three or four verses describing all the detail that goes into this commandment. He says your kids shouldn't work. Your servants shouldn't work. Your animals shouldn't be working. No one should be working. And even even expresses because this is the example that I put forth when I created the world. In Exodus chapter 31, he gives us an example of that. And he says this, one day a week, God says this, will, be, will always serve as a reminder that I made the heavens and the earth in six days, and then on the seventh day, I rested. It's important that even so much so that God modeled it for us. Now, why did God relax and rest on the seventh day? Was he tired from creating the universe? Does God get tired no, the Bible is very clear on that. God doesn't get tired. That word rest that's referring to in Christ or in God is that he stopped and he celebrated. And he did this to model it for us, to give us an example of what we're to do every seven days. We are to stop and we're to rest. So let me ask you a question here, okay, this morning, because this is what got to me. If God modeled it in creation, if it's the fourth commandment out of those big Ten Commandments in Scripture, if Jesus himself modeled it time and time again in ministry, shouldn't it matter to us? Or, or are you busier than God? That hit me to the heart, too. I was like, oh. You may argue, some of you out there say, wait a minute, the Sabbath, that's Old Testament stuff. We're now under a law of grace. It doesn't matter. It doesn't apply to me. And I would disagree with you. I would agree with you that we are not bound by the letter of the law. We are not required to fulfill the law for salvation. Jesus Christ did that on the cross. We are still under, though, the heart of God. And the heart of God is all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament. And the Sabbath began way before the law was ever established. I mean, at the beginning of creation, God said, this is the model that I want you to have. I want you to do this. And if you look at the New Testament, Jesus said in Mark 22, verse 27, he said, the Sabbath was made to benefit man, not man for the Sabbath, meaning that the Sabbath has great benefit for you. We celebrate the Sabbath, not because of the law, but because God says, it's what I want you to do, and I want you to trust me enough to do it, because on your own, you are restless people, you are not rested people. A pastor told a story of a lady who came up to him after service and said, you know, pastor, I tried to call you all day Monday. And the pastor said, well, I'm sorry, but Monday is my day off. It's, it's my Sabbath. And she said, well... The devil doesn't take a day off. To which the pastor replied, yeah, and if I didn't, I'd be just like the devil. <laughs> We've got to rest. We've got to rest. Rick Warren uh, listed three things that happen when you observe the Sabbath. I want you to write these down. This is things that we ought to strive for as we're obeying the Sabbath. I want you to write these down in your notes. Number one, what happens when you take the Sabbath is you rest your body. You rest your body. Take time off before you burn out. Right next to that, I want you to write just physical health. This is what you focus on with the Sabbath. How much longer would we live if we relaxed a little bit? One day a week. Number two, 
Rick says, it recharges your emotions. Recharge your emotion. I want to do something. I want to just have a, a, just a second of quiet. Just listen to this real quick right here. Oh, he's going to make a noise. There's something so soothing about solitude, about quietness, something that can recharge our emotions in a very, very loud world. Right next to that, I want you to write mental health on that. Recharge your mental health. Number three, you refocus your spirit. You let your spirit go. You let it worship God for a week or for a day, excuse me. You focus on worship. You know, that's what we do in the church service. We're coming out of our everyday life, the business of our life, and we're spending time to focus on worshiping God. And I want to let you know that a focused spirit is a strong believer. So add to that spiritual health. And then I added one more to this list, and that is recalibrate your priorities. Recalibrate your priorities. Compare what's important in your life to what's important to God. Match those up and pursue them over what the world is chasing. The Bible says, let the world chase what the world is chasing. You follow Christ. And right next to that, I want you to write healthy direction. So let me ask you, with those four things in mind, do you see a benefit of taking a day of rest in your life this morning? Can you see a need to rest your body to recharge your mind and emotions, to refocus your spirit, to recalibrate your priorities. If that's the case, then you need to consider celebrating the Sabbath. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to conclude today with some practical steps that you can take to rest in the goodness of God, okay? When we lived up in uh, Green Bay, or at least up in the Washington Island area, we, were, we still are big-time Green Bay Packer fans. Uh, and a couple years ago, while we were living up there, the Green Bay Packers went through a, a, a rough patch in their season. They lost like three games in, the row, in a row. And if you were living in Green Bay, you might as well have thought that the world had come to an end at this point. I mean, people were stressed out. They were so worried. They they were thinking about who they're going to fire, getting rid of coaches, everything else, all of this upheaval. And the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, Aaron Rodgers, did a radio interview with one of the local radio stations. And as he was there, these questions came flooding in for what are we going to do? Oh my gosh, our season's over. We are supposed to be the best. And as all of these questions were coming, Aaron, who is quite calm in his, in his voice already, he just said into the microphone, he spelled, R-E-L-A-X. Relax. And it was just this amazing thing. Next thing you know, you saw t-shirts, relax. You saw billboards, relax. You saw everything. Aaron said, relax. We got to relax. And it was the change of the attitude in Green Bay and also was the change of the season. They went on to win like nine games in a row after that, something pretty amazing. But anyway, that's what I want to do this morning. I want to learn how to relax in the presence of God, in the goodness of God. I want to live a more sane life. I want to live a more balanced life. I want to live a less stressed and more blessed life. If the Lord is my shepherd, if I know I will lack nothing, that means if you're following God, you're following a good shepherd who is the Christ, he's not going to lead you in the path of the rat race. He's going to lead you to the green pastures. He's going to lead you beside the still waters. He's going to give you signs of tranquility and peace. And I want you to see these principles from God's word that will help you relax in the goodness of God this morning. The first one is I want you to remember my value to God. That's the starting point. Your value should be found in Christ alone, not in your workplace, not in your positions, not even in man's opinions of you. Because guess what? Those are shallow. Those are shifting sands. They are always changing, and they can be taken away from you like that. Your value comes from God. Your heavenly Father created you which means God doesn't create anything without intention. The very fact that you are here means that you have a purpose. God did not create you for no reason. You're alive because God loves you, and he wanted you alive. The Heavenly Father created you. That's your value. You're priceless. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that you are his masterpiece. 
Think about that. Do you see yourself that way in God this morning? Do you realize how important you are? James chapter 1 says this. This is what God says about you. God decided to give us life. And that's a big deal in and of itself. Through the word of truth, that's, that's Jesus Christ. So that we might be, and I want you to get this, the most important of everything God has created. Do you know that you are more important than the moon today? You are more important than the Milky Way. You are treasured in God. You are so valuable to God Almighty that He would rather die than live without you. Because that was what was happening. Sin had broken this connection, broken this friendship, broken this family at at the Garden of Eden. And God had to come up with a way to reunite us Because in our sin, we were separated from God and we were bound for eternal damnation. We were bound for death. We were bound for eternal separation and God just would not have it. And so he paid the ultimate price in his love for you. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ. He came down and lived a perfect life. He taught us about the goodness of God. And then he showed that goodness of God by dying on the cross, paying the penalty for our sin. He said, you value so much to God that I'm going to do this. This is how much you're valued to God. And he gave up his spirit. And when he rose from the dead, he conquered death. And now those who receive him as Lord and Savior has eternal glory with God in eternity. You have a connection with God. You have a relationship with God. You are co-heirs with Christ. You are valued to God. Number two, you remember your value to God. You enjoy what I already have. I must enjoy what I already have. Alan gave me a quote this week. I thought it was great. It says, the world says, get all you can, then can all that you get, and then sit on your can. (laughs) I thought that was pretty funny. The world says, get, get, get. God says, contentment. God says, contentment. Contentment doesn't come natural for human beings. You're not by nature a contented person. You're a discontented person. We are not resting sheep. We are restless sheep. Philippians chapter 4 says this, I've learned, this is what Paul says, I want you to notice that it says, I've learned. Contentment is something you learn. You can be educated in it. I've learned the secret of being content in, every, in any and every circumstance or situation, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, whether I'm living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him, that's Christ, who gives me strength. I believe that learning how to be content in life first requires unlearning discontent, unlearning our nature, being willing to rely on God to meet our needs. It's this whole shift of creating and storing treasures on earth to storing treasures in heaven. So I have to remember that I value to, I'm value to God. The other thing I have to do is I have to enjoy what I already have. I have to learn to be content. And then what else, the other thing I have to do is I have to limit my work to six days a week. How many of you can do that? That's hard. This is a challenging one. I must limit my work to six days a week. As I was studying this, I found out something really interesting. Did you know that your heart actually beats differently every seven days? You are biologically wired for a day of rest. Now this whole idea of where God says, I want you to have a day of rest. I want you to have a day of rest and worship. I want you to have a Sabbath. I want you to know that this is not for God's benefit. This isn't something that you can just, so you can check off a list. This is not some arbitrary law. God did this so that you will not burn out. And when I ignore this, who gets hurt? I can tell you who it's not. It's not God. It's us. I get hurt. I want to ask you this morning, when is your Sabbath? What day is your Sabbath? I want to tell you that there's no particular day that you have to have 
for it to be a holier day versus others. The New Testament is so clear on that. What it does say is pick a day, get alone with God, spend a day meditating on God and worship. My Sabbath is on Friday. It's not on Sunday because, look, I'm working. But on Friday, I put the phone away. I, I focus on recharging my body, arresting my body, my emotions, my spiritual health, all of those things. And I wish I could say I'm really good at it, but I'm not because I cheat a lot on that day. But you need to do it. Number four, I adjust my values. I must adjust my values. Now, why do I say this? Because to reduce the busyness in your life, you're going to have to change the way that you think about what's important. You need to write a question down, a very important question that just says, what is most important in my life? In Mark chapter 8, it says this, what good is it? What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? And you can say, but wow, look at all the great stuff I have and look at this great house and look at all the accomplishment that I've done. And I can say, well, that's great, but how's your soul? Did you forfeit your soul in the process? Did you forfeit your relationships? Did you forfeit a loving God? Did you forfeit loving your neighbors as yourself? Did you forfeit the neglection of meeting together in worship as some are in the habit of doing? What does it profit a man if you gain the whole world and you're super successful, but you forfeit your soul in the process? Nothing. It doesn't mean anything. I have to adjust my values. I have to see what's most important. Fifth thing and final thing is I must exchange my restlessness for God's peace. I must exchange my restlessness for God's peace. I exchange it. I give it up. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. I'm going to give up my tendencies to roam, my tendencies to wander, my tendency to veer off course. I'm going to exchange my restlessness for God's peace. And then, and then let God move in me. I want to end with, with Matthew chapter 11. And this is this. This is Jesus talking. I want to use the message paraphrase version of this. I just love it. It says this. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out? Come to me. Notice he didn't say, go to a doctor. Go take a class. Drink a five-hour energy drink. He says, come to me. This is about relationships. He says, get away with me. I love that. Spend a day with me. Jesus says, you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me, people. Watch how I do it. And this is my favorite line. Look at this line. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. As your pastor, I want you to learn the unforced rhythms of grace when you rest in the goodness of God. He said, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. You'll learn to live freely and lightly. You come to Jesus. He isn't going to load on you more. He isn't going to, he's going to take it off of you. That's incredible. This has been a challenge for me this week. And I want to give you this challenge. Take a Sabbath day. Try it. Don't cheat. You'll only cheat yourself. Remember, this is for you. This is for your benefit. Your best requires rest. It might be that the most holy thing that you can do this week, the most important thing that you can do this week is take a break. Okay? Your pastor gives you a prescription to take a break. Relax. Rest. Try picking a day this week and call it your Sabbath. Don't call it your day off. Because your day off, you can cheat. It just becomes another day. But call it a day of rest. When you call it a day of rest, you're giving it purpose. You're giving it a cause. Remember, rest is, an intention, rest is intentional. It doesn't just happen. Okay? And when you do that, I want you just on that day, focus on those four things. Say, I'm going to rest my body today. I'm going to recharge my emotions. I'm going to refocus my spirit. And I'm going to recalibrate my direction. 
see what will happen. I have a suspicion that we'll live to be 120 years old if we would learn to keep the Sabbath. I have a suspicion that we'd be a lot happier as people. That some of those things that we call stresses right now will actually flip and we'll be like, oh my gosh, we're really blessed. I have a feeling that Trinity would become that much more of a joyful congregation if we take a break. So let's try it. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this time together. And uh, Lord, um, boy, this has been a tough one for me. I, I, I am not a restful person. I, I feel guilty when I, when I sit and when I rest. But God, it is seen through your word. It is such an important thing that you established. One of the first things that you did when you made creation, one of the first acts that you had when you made man, is you showed us how to rest. You made it part of your commandments. The Son of Man rested time and time again through ministry. And God, I will confess to you that I have taken the way of the world and I have learned to be busier than God. I have learned to be so busy and so stressed and so out of touch that I've, that I've actually, when I've had you in my life, I've seen it more as a burden than as a joy, like Mary and Martha. And God, I need to get my priorities in straight in, 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 together. And I think that requires me to relax. And I think this congregation, God, could benefit so, so greatly from just following the manual. And would we learn to relax? Would we learn to rest in the goodness of God? Would we trust the good shepherd to lead us to green pastures and quiet waters? Knowing that your best for us is, is on your mind. Lord, we love you. We give you this day. In Jesus' name, amen.